In today's show, I had my good friend and former Major League Baseball player, Christian Bergman, on the show. Christian and I have crossed paths many times. We started playing against each other in college back in 2008. We crossed paths again in the minor leagues back in 2012. And he actually went a lot further than me and got to the big leagues and had a long career as a late round draft pick. Christian shares how he signed for $1,000 and beat all of the odds. It's a very crazy story. I want you guys to make sure you watch all the way to the end so you can see it. But we also talk about his career since then. He's actually in my coaching program now for real estate investing and how it's impacted his life and what he plans to do going forward. We go over all the different struggles of baseball, how it's built us both up to become better real estate investors and business owners. So it's an amazing episode. You guys are going to love to watch it. So make sure you stay till the end. Welcome to the Ryan Pineda Show. Where our mission is to invest. I only expect to make money in things that I understand. Innovate. It's about believing in the future and thinking that the future will be better than the past. And inspire. I am much more likely to hit my goal just due to putting it out there. You're now rocking with the best. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of The Ryan Pineda Show. Today, I have a very special guest. He is a former MLB baseball player. He made it much farther than me. And he is now a real estate investor, actually in my coaching program. He's out here doing some big deals. And um, I'm really excited to talk to him about his career as a baseball player and how it's impacted his business and real estate career afterwards. So today, I have none other than my good friend, Christian Bergman. How you doing, man? Good, man. Thanks for having me on. This is exciting. It's been cool to see, you know, this whole buildup from first day I was in here to, to now. Yeah, <laughs> it was very that, different. It was about like a year ago, maybe. Yeah, yeah. about a year ago. So, yeah, it's it's been really exciting, and it's it's also been exciting to see kind of what you're doing now just a year later. So we'll kind of get into that, but I want to give a quick background of me and Christian before he kind of tells his side of the story. So let me, you know, here's the thing in media, guys. When you, when you can tell your narrative first, you, you can, uh, you know, set the tone. But Christian and I actually have been playing against each other a really long time. Um, was your first year in college in 08 as well? Uh, 07. Oh, so, okay, yeah. so he's a year older than me. But uh, we went in the same conference. He went to UC Irvine. I went to Cal State Northridge. And he's a pitcher, and I'm a hitter, so we don't like each other. That's just how it goes. And uh, <laughs> we faced each other a lot throughout college. And before this interview, we were actually trying to figure out, like, who who owned who, you know, while they are playing. But it's it's been pretty tough to find old data because we're, we're getting kind of older now. Yeah, we've wasted probably half the day. Looking yeah, for at that, least but. half the day. <laughs> our, our video guys are like, dude, like, what are we doing? Um, but then we both got drafted the same year, 2010. Mm-hmm. Yep. So we both got drafted in 2010 and we kind of went up at the same time, except that like I got released and I was done. He kept going, but we faced each other in the minor leagues and um, we did find one game. And I'm just going to say this is the only game we found. And the way we were searching was only in games that he won. So, you know, I think it's kind of a skewed data point, but I was over three. I have no idea what happened to those three at bats. We can't figure it out, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> Like it's been about what ten years now, yeah. almost. <laughs> They've probably long since gotten rid of that data. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you would think like with the internet the way it is now, yeah. th- it'd be easy to find records of these games. But dude, we sat there for thirty minutes trying to yeah, figure it, it out. It's probably out there. We just don't know how to do it. <laughs> no, we don't. Not at all. Some if you're if you're a baseball data nerd, um, try and figure out what Ryan Pineda versus Christian Bergman did our entire lives. Figure, <laughs> like just figure it out. Send me a DM. And uh, that way we can figure out who truly has, like, the bragging rights. So, anyways, dude, so kind of just tell us uh, about your story, man. Like, you know, how you came up in baseball and just um, – I, I love what you've shared as as your career because it's not a typical big league career, you know, so. Yeah, um, you know, as, as you were saying, came up pretty much kind of at the same pace going through college, you know, I was – guess you could say a standout in high school which is you know for for someone who gets as far as I did is not uncommon but it's by no means uh you know required but then I got to college and you know I'm sure you experienced it as well it's it's a different game each level you go up um didn't get drafted my junior year uh had basically the exact same year my senior year and for whatever reason I got drafted and 
you know, I remember watching the draft in 2009, watched every single round back when they had 50 rounds. And I should say, listen, because they don't even televise anything after the first round. (laughs) Right. Uh, But yeah, I watched the whole thing. Didn't, didn't hear my name get called. So um, again, had the same year, senior year, got drafted, but I always thought, you know, just give me a chance. Yeah. Let me get my foot in the door. I'll do the rest. Uh, And what did they pay you for a bonus? A thousand dollars. Before bucks. taxes. Yeah. Before. So for the, and that's the reason I asked that, because yeah. for those of you who are watching this, you have heard my story many times where I'm like, I made 1200 bucks a month. Like people think I, I got wealthy because of baseball. And I'm like, guys, no, like that actually hindered me mm-hmm. from making money. And, um, people think that, oh, if you get drafted, you also made a lot of money. And it's like, no, actually, did you know, most people don't get barely anything signing, right. especially a senior, a senior getting a thousand bucks is like the standard. Right, exactly. Yeah, so, um, you know, went to rookie ball, and again, I, I see this theme that kind of repeats itself, you know, throughout my life is, you know, you step up, step up to the next level, and you get knocked down. And it's really a question of, do you get back up? And so I got to rookie ball. Uh, wasn't a good year at all. Uh, there, honestly, is probably a chance that I could have been released just after that year. Typically, you would. I mean, we right. see it happen all the time. Yeah, senior sign, twenty fourth round, gets knocked around in rookie ball. What do they care? Right. <laughs> yeah, know? they have nothing or, to lose. Yeah. So, uh, went to spring training the next year, um, and had a good spring, but uh, was hoping to skip short season A, which, and without going too far into that, like those levels don't even exist anymore. But um, it's basically for you know, as you know, college and. Um, and high school kids who are drafted, so they have somewhere to go play. Right. So to have to repeat short season. So you went to extended spring training. Oh, yeah. Dang. I, I never had to go through that. Yeah, so <laughs> – but that that's – I'm glad you brought that up because that's a really important piece of this, which I probably would have forgotten. But in extended spring training, uh, that's where I figured out what I needed to do to be successful. And – uh there are multiple ways, and I'll talk about this more, but there's multiple ways you can look at any situation. Most of the guys that went to extended spring training that had been drafted the year before were pissed. Yeah, and let and, me, let me before you tell the rest of the story, yeah. let me explain to everyone what extended spring training is. So in baseball, you've all heard of spring training. You know, you show up February, March, and, you know, you get ready for the season. So what happens is during spring training – people, you know, get assigned to their teams. You're going to, you know, A ball, you know, low A, high A, double A, triple A, the big leagues, right? Everybody's fighting to make a team. Well, there's a lot of people who who don't make any team, right? But the organization doesn't want to release them. So what they do is they keep them in extended spring training. And so you're literally in spring training. It's like uh, Groundhog's Day every day. You're just in there for months until what Christian's calling short season starts and short season is for all the people who just got drafted. Right. And so like, that's what you do the year before. Right. And then to like go through extended and do it again is like, man, for most people, it's like this, my career's like screwed. Like this is just yeah. not what I thought. Right. Exactly. So, um, I, I, I don't remember exactly what I was thinking at the time, but I was like, look, I'm still here. I'm still an extended. Um, and like you said, it's groundhog day. Uh, you literally you're up at it was like seven o'clock in the morning. Your day's Crazy. done by you know one or two, which is nice, but it's literally the same thing over and over every single day. Um, playing a lot of the same teams over and over again, and there's no stats. It's nothing. no stats. It's nobody's just watching. Nothing. Uh, it's hot. <laughs> You know? And you're seeing everybody else, like, you know, on the other teams above you playing, getting stats and fans. And, and guys are getting plucked out of extended as guys get hurt um, and come back to spring training. I was never one of those guys. So, but again, uh, the whole point of that was that that's where I figured out what I needed to do to pitch without going too far into that. I had, for- had forgotten how to pitch in college because the coaches call you pitches. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you get to pro ball. Nobody's calling your pitches anymore. No. In a, in a way, you don't even know what you're good at. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you tell me to do this, yeah. I'll do it. Yeah. So in extended spring training, that's where I figured it out. I go to short season, uh, have a really good season, and that was like – Were you a starter or a reliever starter. then? Starter. Okay. Um, and, 
yeah, had a really good season um, and just started getting momentum there. Going to 2012, uh, which is when we played against each other, um, probably one of the best years statistically of my career, um, and just kept riding this momentum wave and, you know, kept improving and stuff. But I always stayed pretty true to who I was as a pitcher. Um, didn't throw hard. You know, had to do the little things. But more than anything, mental side of things was was huge for me because I didn't have all the physical gifts, um, natural velocity, stuff like that. Um, so anyway, I get to uh, Colorado Springs, AAA, and here comes this this mindset thing again. So Colorado Springs, as you know, high altitude, not a great place to pitch. <laughs> and it's for actually, the, yeah, yeah. For but, those of you who don't know, you know, high altitude, because most people wa- listening to this don't really – grasp the full context but like if you're in Colorado or a place like Utah where there's high altitude the ball flies further me as a hitter we love it we're like yo that fly ball we just hit that we thought would just been an out is a home run or a double and so pitchers though they hate it and every single one of them's complaining you know all this stuff and um you know so you had to go through that yeah so get assigned to triple a Colorado Springs which is you know obviously you're one step away now and I remember I had my first or second start went okay. Uh, but you know, around the clubhouse and everything, people are, you know, they have a bad game or a bad outing and they're like, Oh, this altitude, it sucks. And I don't know what came over me, but I was just like, you know what? I'm not going to fall into this, this bad state of mind where, Oh, it's not, there's nothing I can do about it. It's just a bad place to pitch. Uh, and long story short, Literally from that day forward, I didn't give up a run for like a month. And I honestly think it was a shift in mindset where I decided, no, I, I'm I'm not going to do that. And um, so, you know, get to the end of that. And a little side note, uh, I was so locked into what I was doing as far as what I could control. I didn't even realize that I didn't win a game the entire month. <laughs> really? <laughs> that I didn't give up a run. I, I set the record in the in the in that stadium at home, but I also set a record that I didn't know about, which was longest consecutive innings without any runs of run support. <laughs> You're like you were like Jake Degrom, <laughs> yeah, that one year. Yeah. But I didn't even realize it. Yeah, because you, I was so you're just in. Hey, this is what I can control. And you know what's interesting? Without getting too heavy into baseball analytics, yeah. um, there's a big. Ba- there's been a baseball analytics revolution for like the last 10, 15 years. And it used to be in baseball, hey, if you had the most wins, you had a great year as a pitcher. But even as myself, like when I was in high school, I remember I would think about that. I'm like, you can't even control if like. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, like it. even, you know, they've, they've realized that ERA can be inflated and that, you know, the things that you can control are things like strikeout rate, walk rate. You know, if you get ground balls, like they those things can be controllable as a pitcher, but everything else that happens after you release that ball, you know, it is what it is. Right. Somebody makes an error. Somebody's not positioned right. It is what it is. Yep. So I, I think that's crazy that um, you were that locked in, a, you know, able to do what you did um, with that. And I remember you telling us that story at the mastermind for our coaching program um, last quarter. Was it last quarter? Yep. Yeah. And, I didn't expect you to share a story or anything because you're kind of a quiet guy. <laughs> and you're like, I want to share this story about, you know, just mindset shift of this is what I was going through. And I think as well, like, you came up through the system as a nobody, essentially, like the bottom of the barrel, the senior sign, low draft pick, and, you know, not throwing super hard, not doing it. Like, if there was anybody who had the odds stacked against them, there, it was you. Like, there's nothing else you could have really done to make you even like stacked worse. Right. And you still persevered through all that extended spring training. I didn't even go through that, but I can tell you, I'd have probably mentally broke. I'd have been like, dude, screw this. Like I got better things to do with my life. And then to go and learn how to pitch again, like you said, how to make the most of the talent you had and then how to, you know, have a great year and keep progressing and then reach triple a, and then just do something that no one's ever done before. So what happened after that? Uh, nothing. (laughs) (laughs) That was the crazy part. Nothing happened. I'm like, okay. I I was in terms of close to a breaking point. That was about as close as I got because 
I had just built that up to like, I, I was like, man, all right, this is where he gets his big chance. And then, well, hey, I'm kind of you know, <laughs> slow playing you there, but <laughs> when I say nothing, it was like a week or two later, nothing had happened. And I, I'm not sure on the, I could have the dates wrong on that, but, um, but anyway, the point was like, Rockies weren't doing well. There were some injuries. Like there were other guys going up. And even during that that period where, you know, I had that really good streak going, guys were going up and it wasn't me. And I was like, okay, I'm I'm pretty close to breaking here. <laughs> right. At that point too, it's like, you know, first you're like, hey, well, it's like a shift. Hey, just give me a shot. Give me a shot. Let me prove myself, right? right. And then you prove yourself multiple years. And then like you prove yourself to literally the highest level that one could pitch. And then you're like, what else could I possibly yeah, do? That's like, exactly what I thought. <laughs> I don't know what else to do. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, and just as a kind of to tie this into, we'll talk about later, financially, money-wise, you alluded to the salary. Well, even in AAA, that original contract you signed, your AAA salary is set from the day you're drafted. It's like 2000 bucks. right? That yeah, was 2200 something like that. It's crazy. Colorado Springs was not a – cheap place to live by any means. Um, I realized I was going to run out of money. <laughs> yeah. You're like During this way, and this it, close to the bigs. Yeah. And I, and I'm, it's not like I'm out having steaks. Like I'm eating, you know, peanut butter and jelly in the clubhouse and, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. And I realized I was gonna run out of money. So luckily, um, I don't know, two weeks after that, uh, got the call and, you know, a lot of people would say, oh, well, that's lucky. But, and yes, there is a, I guess, a degree of luck. But if I didn't do all this stuff before and then I got to that position, my name doesn't get called. Right. So, um, anyway, I got called out and made my debut. Um, again, this theme comes back. Um, third start, broken hand. Line drive off my hand. Oh, who hit it? Aramis Ramirez. Oh. Brewers, yeah. Um, tried to stay in the game. I knew I knew something was wrong. I tried to stay in. I'm too stubborn and didn't go well. Get an X-ray after the, after the game and it's broken. Mm. Uh, Sixty day DL. Man. So now I'm just sitting. <laughs> so but you, at like least I, you were getting paid. Yeah, that that's the bright side. Obviously, <laughs> obviously uh, if you get hurt in the minor leagues, you get nothing. something like that. You yeah, get nothing. you so, go to extended. <laughs> yeah, most likely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in the big uh, leagues, you you get a the half a mil. Yeah. Proration. Yeah. So, um, yeah, stayed up, you know, came back, uh, rehab my hand, eventually came back that year, stayed up. They kept me in the big leagues, um, got my first win, finished the year out in the big leagues, made the team out of spring training the next year um, as a as kind of swing guy, um, starter and reliever, and then made the team again in 2016. Then, you know, a lot of the up and down started. Um, then, I got hurt again in 2016 at a really bad time and um, it was torn oblique, something again, like can't yeah. really control. Um, so went on the DL, came back at a bad time. The team had already kind of filled my role. So at the end of that, um, the Rockies let me go. Uh, so then re-signed with Seattle, did a lot of the up and down there. Um, and, you know, like you kind of said, it's putting all the work in, getting like the thing that you want and then having it taken away. Right. Con consistently. Like it just wears on you after a while. Yeah. And I, I can tell you firsthand, man, you know, I never got to the bigs or anywhere close to the levels you got, but you know, we all can relate to the struggle when you're a pro baseball player and just like what you're talking about. And I even remember for me, um, just whether it was playing time, whether it was being sent down, um, whether it was being released. Like, I've experienced all those things. And, man, when people ask me about business, they're like, man, like, do you ever get stressed out or anything? I'm like, no, not really. Because in baseball, every single day I was stressed out. Like, because you just don't know if it's your last day. Because it literally could be your last day ever. I mean, right. you can get hurt, like you said, and you never recover. You could get released and no one signs you. You know, you could age out, you know, you just get older and right. it, the young guys are coming up and it is what it is. And so you literally are playing every game, you know, as if it could be your last. And also too, knowing that it, it really is like, this is not something that lasts forever. Right. 
you know, it's not like real estate investing where I have no, I'm like, yeah, I mean, I, I'll do this the rest of my life. Like there's nothing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So that it for sure teaches mental toughness more than anything, having to go through that on just a dated. Well, and the other part too, I forgot to mention is, you know, we talk about competition and other things like that. You know that the guy right behind you is right on your heels, like waiting for you to mess up, to get hurt, to do something stupid. And that way, because that, that's the only way they get a call up. Like it is what it is. I mean, pitchers are a little different because you guys have, you guys all do the same thing. <laughs> and there's there's 12 <laughs> of you on the team, right? But when you're a second baseman and that's right. your only, there's only one guy. And so it's like, you you know who that guy is, whereas the pitchers, it's a little different. Yeah. But I mean, you can even break that down. There are certain guys, you know, certain roles and stuff like that. You always know yeah. that, that there's somebody that's, um, that's obviously gunning for where you are. And uh, in 2015, I was in the big leagues the whole year. It was really hard to enjoy it. Because you're just constantly looking behind your back, like yeah, because yeah. of you know, kind of my just background, but um, also the role I was in is a very can be depending on how the team does it, it can be a very fluid role, right? Uh, sometimes they call it a revolving door because as soon as you throw, you're out. The next guy's up, and then as soon as he throws, the next guy's up, and it's just a revolving door, guys. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it was kind of hard to enjoy that year. Yeah. So tell me about, you know, uh, how it came to an end, like what, what happened and all that. Yeah, so uh, 2019, I signed briefly with the Cubs. Um, they let me go uh, probably the second round of cuts out of big league camp uh, in 2019. So I uh, found myself going to, um, I think I worked out maybe for the rest of spring and then went to Sugarland which was independent ball and yep. you, you played independent ball. You know how that is. Yep. Um, and I got to Sugarland end of, I guess it would be April or whatever it was. But um, as soon as I get there, the Mariners call, Hey, do you want to come to, to Tacoma dribbling? Yes. Get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so go up there for a month. Um, and yeah, so wasn't throwing well. And I, I recognized I wasn't even the pitcher that I was years before. You know, like I said, I didn't throw hard, but I would have had to – I realized two things. One, I wasn't throwing hard enough. I never threw hard, but I didn't – I wasn't throwing hard enough to get guys to even honor my fastball. And um, so they basically – and my best pitch was my changeup. So they'd basically have to – Yeah. They, they could just react. Yeah, you because, have to have enough separation where they have right. to guess. Exactly. So um, I've recognized that. And in order to keep going, and again, like, you know, being spit out into independent ball, it's really hard to get back in. Yeah. You know, I'm 31. I'm on the, you know, on the wrong side of 30. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it seems like these 21 year olds are getting in the big yeah, leagues every day, yeah. just crushing. It's yeah. crazy. <laughs> uh, and then realizing that in order to even be relevant again, I would have to make huge wholesale changes. It would take a lot of time dedication to do that and I didn't have it anymore you know yeah <laughs> I, I the, the passion wasn't there anymore you know I, I did some really cool things was able to get to a really high level uh, but I knew that in order to get back it would take that same level of dedication and passion and it just wasn't there and yeah. I wasn't going to waste time trying to try and do it because I had other things I wanted to do right yeah I think every athlete comes to that and so do you think like you had peace going out yeah it was hard, definitely, to, you know, finally say this is it. Yeah. Uh, it was definitely hard to accept it, but at the same time, uh, it was easy in a way because it made so much sense. Yeah. Um, well, and you, you had a future that you were already working towards. Right. And, like, I'll say, too, for me, I think the biggest thing I see with most athletes is they don't have peace with, you know, being done with sports, you know, whether they played pro or not, you know, and that's tough. And I was a guy, I was a guy who had peace because I, I was able to play as long as I wanted to play, even though it wasn't at the level I wanted to play at, I still played and I enjoyed it and I had fun. Um, and by the time I got released, um, I just mentally was like already into the future. Like I was right. full blown in real estate and I was like, dude, like, 
this is kind of becoming a waste of time now. Like it's <laughs> to me, it was like a hobby at that point. Right. And so I had peace and I never even thought like, man, did I quit too early? And that's kind of like the one thing I wanted to make sure I did was just not have a regret of like quitting too early. Cause you know, there's a lifespan. Right. So I'm, I'm glad that that happened for you too, man. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about what, what's happened now. I mean, that was 2019. It's only been a year and a half since. So what, what happened? So, you know, while I was playing, um, once I got some money to play around with, uh, <laughs> after that call up and when I went on the DL, honestly, um, and you know, I was getting paid all that money to do nothing. <laughs> I kind of thought, you know, I should figure out what to do with this. You know, some guys give it to their financial advisor uh, and just hand it off and just place all their trust in, in another person. And I, you know, I had the time. I didn't want to do that. I was kind of a, I was curious about different things. So started learning about stock market, um, doing stuff like that, and didn't like, you know, the, the lack of understanding. Um, just it, it seemed like I didn't have the same access to information that, yeah. you know, that's almost required, I guess. Um, so started looking at real estate. And was like, oh, okay, I can understand this. I can, you know, more or less control this. Um, so bought my first property in uh, 2015. And my kind of goal at the time was uh, to live in it during the off season. In, it was in Arizona. Have spring training there. Um, or, yeah, I live there in the off season. Then during the season, rent it out. So, you know, maybe at least like, you know, cover the, uh, the uh, payment uh, during the off season or during the season and, uh, you know, just start building equity and stuff like that. In practice, it wasn't that easy, uh, because Airbnb VRBO, I think was, you know, it was starting to get going, but it, it didn't, it wasn't at the level it's at now. Right. Uh, so, you know, but anyway, it, it worked well and I started to understand it. I was like, okay, I like this. So the next year I bought uh, a rental just strictly as a rental. Um, started renting it out and, um, my reason at the time I paid cash for it because I was, I was in the big leagues that whole year. I paid cash for it. Cause I was like, okay, if I don't really know what I'm doing, I at least don't want like a loan hanging <laughs> over my head. Yeah. Uh, so it ended up going well. Um, it was obviously, you know, pure cash flow, which was nice. Yeah. Uh, next year, um, bought mm-hmm. another house, moved out of the one I was living in. This would have been 2020, right? 2017. Oh, this is 20. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I was, I was basically buying one a year, doing a mix playing. of, you know, living in it and then moving out, turning it into a rental. So by 2019, uh, let's see, I, would have, I had three rentals and, you know, my primary residence. And my goal leading up to that was like, I just want my primary residence to pay for itself during the season because I got to go live in, you know, wherever the heck I'm playing. <laughs> Whoever wants me. Yeah. <laughs> Whoever will <laughs> <Anywhere>. have me. <laughs> That's definitely true though yeah uh, for sure true <laughs> but yeah so that, that was my plan and, and it worked and so you know in between my starts literally all I was doing was reading about real estate and stuff like that I think I connected with you right around that time I, I saw you on or heard you on the bigger pockets podcast like oh I remember playing against him so yeah. I think I reached out to you just ask you some some questions or something but um so yeah I was doing that and I was in between starts again learning and I'm like okay what do I have to do whenever that day I'm done playing comes what do I have to do to make it so that that income pays for what I want you know which and it wasn't a big number it was like four or five thousand dollars a month I'm pretty easy going (laughs) uh you know mine used to be that way too now I'm like I know yeah I'm gonna need to make at least like 50 grand a month to like (laughs) I'm I'm the same way (laughs) uh so but I looked at it, I was like, okay, how many times would I have to replicate this, my current little portfolio, in order to get there? I was like, oh, I only have to buy 20 more houses or whatever it was, 10, 12, something like that. Something where I was like, okay, I'm going to need to make a lot more money <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, to do that. So I kept bumping into the issue of scale. How do I scale this? And again, I was still playing baseball at the time. Obviously, you scaled a, a flipping business. Yeah. Um, and in order to do that, you had to, you know, like you said, stop playing. And I wasn't, I wasn't there yet. Um, so by the time I was done playing to kind of fast forward, it's like, okay, I got all this time now. 
what do I want to look into? What do, what do I want to do? So I think originally, um, I, I think I asked you about a wholesaler and I, and to be honest, I didn't even know what a wholesaler was. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'll work for this wholesaler and see how that goes. I lasted six days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember you telling me that now. <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah. Uh, and I remember you I, asked I, me. I was like, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I don't know. I don't know why you said that. Maybe you, you knew that it wasn't going to work. Oh, I knew it wasn't. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> it was sarcastic. Uh, yeah. But I don't know if you could see that in the DMs. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I think I sensed something though. But anyway, um, I was like, yeah, this is not what I want to do. So yeah, quickly uh, exited that. And uh, I think that's when I contacted you and we talked about, I think I related all that to you, what I was looking to do. Yeah. Um, and so joined your, your coaching program. And to learn about flipping because I was in Phoenix, like, you know, very similar market. Yeah. Um, we have the baseball connection. I thought, you know, this will be a, a good, you know, person to, to, to have to go to. Yeah. Um, so started going down that road and learning everything from you. And um, so I think pretty quickly bought my first deal. Yeah. Because and I, I remember you talked about this, uh, you know, investing in, in mentorship and coaching and stuff like that it puts the pressure on you to actually go do something. Right. You know, um, so bought that first deal and, and, and went to work on it. And um, to make a very long story short, I found out very quickly, I don't like flipping houses. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, uh, there's a couple of things you hit on there. Um, but before we get into all those things, let's hear a quick word from our sponsor. Are you looking to grow your real estate investing business? My company, Future Flipper, can help. We've taught hundreds of people all over the country how to flip, wholesale, and buy rental properties. And it doesn't matter where you're at in your investing journey. Whether you're trying to get your first deal or scale your company, Future Flipper can help. We have courses, coaching, and events for all levels of investors. So if you want to take the next step, go to futureflipper.com and book a free consultation to see how we can best help you. Once again, that's futureflipper.com. One of the hardest parts about real estate investing is finding a good contractor. That's where Southwestern Custom Construction comes in. They've been doing remodels in Nevada and Arizona since 2006. As a fully licensed and bonded general contractor, they're able to help with any type of renovation, all the way from an entry-level fixer-upper to a custom luxury home. Southwestern Custom Construction specializes in working with investors. I've personally used them on many of my projects, so I know their team is legit. If you want to get a bid on a project, head over to customhomenow.com. Once again, that's customhomenow.com. Are you looking to find off-market real estate deals? One of the best tools my team uses is Batch Leads. With Batch Leads, you're able to pull data, manage lists, and send text messages. On top of that, you can get nationwide access to the MLS to get pictures and comps. My team has used Batch Leads to get some of our best deals, so I know it works. You want to start today? You can get half off your first month by going to batchleads.io and using the promo code Ryan. Once again, that's batchleads.io promo code Ryan for half off your first month. Now back to the show. But yeah, so you hit on a few things. You hit on wholesaling. You know, you worked at a wholesaling company. You joined mentorship, and then you flipped your first house. So let me kind of talk about those points. Um, a lot of people who try and get into wholesaling starting out. They either try and do it themselves or they try and work for somebody. Um, the company you tried to work for is a very big company. I'm not going to, you know, name who they are. But the issue was I could tell you're you're an entrepreneur. You know, you wanted to do your own thing, have your own company. And that was why I said, well, why are you even going to go work for them? It doesn't really make sense. Like, why not just start on your own? You, you can do it. Like, there's the resources. I'll help you, whatever. And you're like, well, I, I just want to see what it's like and test it out. And I was like, all right, good luck. And then, um, yeah, you quit after like a week. Yeah. So you even beat my expectations on, on when you would, oh. when you would quit. So, uh, congrats on that. Oh, <laughs> but the Always second, good to outperform. you, you outperformed <laughs> just like your, your baseball career, just constantly <laughs> outperforming. So then you reached out to me and I was like, Hey dude, if you really want to do it, like get into coaching. And as you alluded to my sales pitch to you was, Dude, you know, I know it's a lot of money, but here's the deal. When you actually invest in mentorship or yourself, I mean, as long as you trust that person, you know, you know you're going to learn stuff. But the other side effect is, well, dang, I better go start taking action or else, you know, this money's going to get wasted. 
You know, when people listen to this podcast or watch a YouTube or even read my book, they literally have nothing to lose other than the time they spent watching this, you know, our podcast. Um, but when you invest significant in something, you're like, all right, I better make something happen and get an ROI because mm -hmm. it's real money. Right. So I, I've said that before, and that's why I continue to, like, get out of my own comfort zone. Like, there, there are masterminds I get invited to that are $100,000. And I haven't pulled the trigger on one yet, but I can tell you if I do, <laughs> I'm going to be like. Yeah. You're going to be taking action. Yeah, I'm going to be like, all right. <laughs> I need to meet that guy, that guy, that guy. I need to go to every single event. I'm not missing anything that's included with this. So it changed your mindset for sure. But, um, you know, the third thing you talked about was your first house flip. And I actually, I'm glad you brought this up because I tell people this all the time. I'm like, look, business, real estate, anything you do in life is risky. There's always the chance that you lose money. There's always the chance that, you know, Things out of your control make you lose money. The market shifts or somebody screws you. You know, you could have did everything. Just like we talked about with pitching. Yep. You could have did everything right, thrown the perfect pitch, and then, you know, the guy behind you makes an error or he's not positioned right, and, you know, you you lose. And so, you know, just going into that, I, I want everyone to know, like, there's no safe anything. Rentals aren't safe. Flipping's not safe. Whole set, like, business, life, you're going to die. Like, <laughs> that's life. And so, um, and, you're, and let me just add something there. If, if you live a completely safe life and took zero risk, you haven't lived at all. Right. You've done absolutely nothing. Yeah. You're not getting anywhere. <laughs> yeah. So I love that too. So tell us about that first flip. Like what, what happened? <laughs> Why don't you like flipping? <laughs> well, um, I bought a good deal. I knew it was a good deal. Right. Uh, I stand, I still believe that to this day. Um, and I, I enjoyed sort of the, I, I found out I like looking at deals, underwriting them, analyzing them. I love that stuff. Uh, as far as the going out and, you know, finding contractors or so, some of the stuff that is very important, uh, not, you know, not my favorite thing to do. Um, so bought a good deal, uh, Broke my first rule, or your first rule, <laughs> one of your first, first rules. Uh, didn't get multiple bids on contractors. Used someone I knew um, that I'd used just on my rentals for little jobs here and there. Uh, and long story short, he took advantage of it. And didn't even know, I didn't even know what I, I didn't have anything to compare it to. Right. So broke the first rule there. Um, the other thing, just as, a, as an aside, I didn't negotiate anything on the purchase price. Yeah. If it was from a wholesaler which, you know, I, I think I had misconstrued something you'd said, which is, you know, don't haggle with wholesalers, but you're talking on a much larger basis. You're going to be doing repeat, you know, a lot of business. Mm -hmm. um, so didn't do that. Wish I had. Yeah. Um, and I, I think also wasn't really clear on, uh, on my strategy, which sounds stupid because, well, you're flipping the house. <laughs> but there's a lot more to it than that. And even... You know, again, I take full accountability for it, and I don't blame anyone else. Like, yeah, a lot of people would probably blame the contractor. Or no, I like I was the one calling the shots. Yeah. I made all these mistakes. Sure, some stuff went against me, but you know, it it just didn't go well. But but the the big the big thing is, I can't tell you how much I learned yeah. <laughs> from you. Number one, going through the whole process, and then going out and doing it and getting kicked in the teeth. Yeah. Which again, here's this theme again. <laughs> I go do something, get kicked in the teeth, get back up. I'm Recover. not gonna quit. Yeah. Um, I may not be doing house flipping, but there's <laughs> nothing wrong with going in different directions and adjusting and yeah, you know, figuring out where you fit in. Well, I think failure is our biggest teacher, right? So I failed as a realtor. You know, I got my teeth kicked in and I'm like, Okay, well, um, I can either not fail as a realtor, like figure out why I failed and do something different. Or I can say, I don't want to do this. Right. And I was like, I don't want to do this. Like I'm going down this path. Yep. And so, um, that is why it's good to fail because even if, uh, you would have never did that, right. You still might have this like thought in your head, like, Oh, you know, I want to be a house flipper. I want to do this. And then you're like, actually, you know, now that I've experienced it, I don't want to do wholesaling or house flipping. I want to do this. Right. So why don't you talk about what you want to do now? Well, before, before we go, I want to hit one other thing too. Uh, 
um, the amount of time you saved me <laughs> yeah. by not going down the route of like, uh, maybe I do like house flipping. No, I saw what it takes to be successful. Yeah. Flipping houses. And I, I also tried it myself. I was like, no, none of this lines up with what I want to do. Right. So, you know, yes, like there's some money lost in there. You can't replace time. You can always replace money. Yep. Hundred um, percent. So yeah, I just wanted to make sure. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Give you the the credit there because it's <laughs> it's so true. I mean, who knows how many years I waste trying to figure it out, only to find out I don't want to do it. Well, yeah, and two years wasted of just like consuming content that's right. not applicable. Like you're right. listening to all these podcasts and all this, and you're like, dude, just go do it and figure out if you right. like it or not. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, but anyway, um, as I was going through that. Um, I was obviously looking in other directions as well. And again, I, I liked uh, the rental thing. I just knew that there was no scale. Or it's very hard to scale single family stuff unless you have a machine like you have where you know, you're constantly getting deal flow like that. Right. Um, so I started looking into multifamily. I always had kind of a inkling that I would be eventually move my single family into multifamily. And, but didn't understand how it was structured, you know, didn't really understand a lot about it. So, uh, picked up a few books on it. And I think actually one of the first things I thought found was Grant Cardone, which yeah. really a surprise there. Yeah. But, um, you know, he makes it look very easy it's not necessarily easy, but he, ex he does a good job of explaining the basics and the basics were interesting. So I started going deeper into it, started picking up books, started reading everything I could the more and more I picked up, the more I read, it's like, okay, this sounds like me. There's a lot of time to invest on the front end, kind of like a baseball career. Um, it, it just, everything kind of was very parallel to me. I like the underwriting. There's a lot of underwriting, finding deals. I love that part. And the best part, like the execution stuff, yes, you put the pieces in place, but I'm not going out to the property yeah. necessarily every single day uh, and, and doing all that stuff, especially like swinging the actual hammer. I know you said you <laughs> yeah. do, you never did that. Yeah. I don't but, even know what to do. If one's in my hand. I'm like, yeah, what the heck yeah dude, this is heavy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know, the only time I use hammers was in baseball, like the forearm yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, exercises. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So I, I really started gravitating towards that uh, because there's scale built into it. Number one, you can do one transaction and buy, however many units uh, and then, you know, management is in a way built into it. You're kind of buying a business. Yeah. For and sure. then you can manage the business that appeals to me. Yeah. Um, and you can probably explain why <laughs> that appeals well, to well, me. Well, yeah. Let me actually go into that. I, as you were saying that, um, I think it's really cool that you brought that up because one of the big things we teach in my coaching program are personality traits, right? And so you've seen me talk about this over and over. We make everyone take a test called predictive index. I pay a lot of money every year to have it. And it's pretty freaking accurate. Like you did when you read yours, what'd you think? It's pretty accurate. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's crazy because it kind of puts you into these buckets of, hey, this is like what you naturally like to do. This is kind of how you modify to, you know, fit maybe your job or in society the way that you are. But the, the reality is, if you are doing a job that you're naturally good at, you're going to be very happy, and you're probably going to be really good at it. So, for instance, I'm good at social media and sales because my personality says, like, I'm naturally good at it, and I like to do it. Now, granted, I can keep getting better. I can improve my skills, all that stuff. But my personality also says I am the exact opposite of you with the detail-oriented stuff. I do not want to underwrite deals. I do not want to like look at the numbers and like analyze. Dude, I'm like, hey, let's buy the building. Like everyone else, <laughs> figure it out, you know? Right. And it just shows that with every business and organization, you need both right. to be successful. And so we're talking about like my fund. You and I are both going down this path of funds and single family or not single family, multifamily and stuff. And I'm certain we're going to do a deal together. Um, but we both bring different skill sets to the table, right? I can go out there on camera, go raise some money, promote, and boom, we got the money. I can also do the same thing for deals. Like, hey, you know, anyone got deals? Like, let's partner up. Boom, we got deals and money. So what are we missing? 
We're missing operations. We're missing the guy who underwrites it, who handles compliance, who, you know, makes sure that everything makes sense, that the investors are taken care of and they're safe and that, you know, the deal closes on time. Like there needs to be that guy who handles that, you know, with care because if that guy's not there, that deal's going to fall apart. Mm -hmm. You know, I've seen plenty of deals fall apart. But then you also have those same type of people on every little side of it too. Like you mentioned, the, the project manager, the contractor, like those guys have got to be a certain type of personality. Then there's the guys who, you know, got to property manage it, right? They got to be a lot more strict with these, these tenants and making sure they're getting rents. Like if you're kind of soft, you're going to be a bad property manager. Yep. Tenants are going to walk all over you. So I think, you know, we in my program anyway, we try and help people realize that from the beginning so that they can start playing to their strengths instead of trying to be something they're not. Exactly. Um, and it's funny because a lot of people will ask me, Ryan, what's my first hire? I think that's probably the most common question that we get. What's, what should be my first hire? I'm like, well, it's going to be different than mine. Like everyone's first hire is different. Like if you're really good at sales, Hire, hire that detail-oriented guy who can handle the operations in the back end. If you're really good at operations and you're fair, you know, you're scared to talk to sellers and stuff, you should not talk to sellers. I, I, I see a lot of people who are like trying to just like bulldoze through even though they're not good at it and they're trying to become good at it. But in the end, even if they tried to become good at it, they still might be like average. Right. So. Yeah, and, and there's a, you know, there's a like a natural inclination towards doing those things, but since you enjoy doing it, you're also going to do the extra stuff to get even better at it. Um, so you know, whereas someone who's like in a role that does not you know coincide with their personality, it feels like work. It's stressful. Hundred percent. They're not going to do the extra stuff. No, they're they're like counting. <laughs> yeah. Man, is it five o'clock yet? Like, right. what are we doing? Yeah. Whereas I'm like, man, I got to go home. Oh, man. All right. Yeah. You, know, you look up, you don't even know what time it is. No, I just, yeah. I love doing what I do every day. And every time I, I do something I hate, I'm like, all right, who the who do I need to hire to do this job? This sucks. Yeah. So I think that that's good that you, you've experienced all these things to, to find what it is you enjoy. Um, you know, you, you brought up Grant Cardone. Um, who knows? One day he might be on this podcast. <laughs> GC, you know, if you're watching, make sure you... You comment below if you want to be on, <laughs> but, um, with, with him, right. He is definitely not good at everything, but what, what would I say? Grant Cardone's good at, I mean, he's known for sales. He's a beast at sales and closing deals. He's a beast marketer, right? That guy can market with the best of them. Do I think Grant Cardone is managing his fund as the operator and, you know, doing everything? No, probably not. No, he's got partners, <laughs> he's got employees and they're handling everything else. He goes and jumps on stage and raises a hundred million bucks, and then he lets his team just handle the rest. Yeah. So, yeah, he, he's living in his like best element. Exactly. Yeah, and, and and again, I think it's really important that I went down that path with you mm -hmm. to understand, you know, to fully understand that. Obviously, the the personality stuff and the tests and everything helped with that. But again, like seeing, you know what types of what type of person you have to be especially in the beginning because you know you don't necessarily have the infrastructure everything to uh to bring people on right away so yeah, i've heard you say it a lot like in the beginning you're wearing all the hats yeah um, and eventually you get to the point where you, you know you have your first hire uh and for me personally i didn't want to go down that route with the flipping it just it didn't it wasn't for me right um, well there's another part to that too and I tell this to a lot of our students and, you know, everyone that you're with is that most successful businesses, I have nothing to back this up with. It's just me <laughs> subjectively looking at it. This is anecdotal. I think that's the right word, right? Yeah. Um, I see that most successful businesses are started with partners. I think very, I think that's the majority. I think the minority is solopreneurs. Mm -hmm. True solo guys. And the reason for that is exactly what we're talking about. There are very few people that can wear all hats and successfully start something from zero and, you know, bring it to a level where they can hire employees and stuff. It's a very rare talent that someone is good at sales. They still have enough detail orientation. They're able to handle operation. Like 
That person is extremely talented. There's nothing like if you're not that person, it's not like you can just force yourself to be like you are. Or you are. It's like uh, right. the guy who throws you know 100 miles an hour. Like right. he is what he is. Yeah. Like what are you gonna do about it? I, yeah. I Let's can't. Let's not try and teach him command. Let's yeah. Just let him throw 100. Yeah. So scare everyone. <laughs> everyone has natural ability, and it just it's God given. What are you gonna do about it? Right. So if that's not you, don't worry. That's normal. But most likely, if you're not succeeding, you're probably just a partner away from having a lot of success. Right. Because I do believe you you could still have a very successful flipping business if you partnered up with somebody who would do the things you didn't want to do, right? For sure. And, you know, it, we talk about money, right? So a lot of times people just starting out, right? Money's the issue. Well, with partners, money's not the issue. You guys are partners. You're not paying this guy. You guys are in it together. And so... That's honestly part of the reason why partnerships start as well is like, yeah, we both can't afford anything. <laughs> right. We're just starting out. Yeah. And and I've in the uh, in the multifamily space, as I've gone down that road, I've very quickly realized what you just talked about. Um, my strength, again, is not uh, going out and raising money. So I found a partner who also, you know, really gets kind of the long term vision I have. Uh but you know he he's good at that sort of thing, um, and he has a network to to help with that. And so he was one of the first people I contacted, um, and you know he's on board with it. So he's helping with uh, with. I already like offloaded that as much as I could. Now, obviously, I'm still doing as yeah. much as I can, but it's a load off my back to to at least know somebody else is working on it. Right. You know? Right. You know, the other thing I want to bring up, too, now that I'm thinking about it, um, you know, people, I think, get the misconception that, you know, being a business owner or something is, uh, you know, you don't work at all, right? Sometimes I, I'm guilty of, like, giving off that vibe. Sure. And there's always work to be done. Now, granted, the amount of hours you work can vary. For instance, at, at my company, TrueBooks, I maybe work, like, a couple hours a month, like towards that company. But those couple hours I work are super, super important. Like whether I'm filming a video right. that drives traffic there or whether I'm giving, you know, high level advice and input that totally changes the structure of the company. For instance, like it's tax season right now and we are backed up like crazy. And, you know, people are wanting to do taxes yet. We, we don't even have any appointments to be able to book them. We're so slammed. And so, you know, my partner is, you know, running the day-to-day. He works 8 million more hours than me. But he's, uh, you know, he, he doesn't have time to, like, look up and be like, hey, what, what do we got to do to fix this leak? Like, we don't want to lose all these clients and customers. And so I look at it for five minutes, and I'm like, oh, here's the leak. This is yeah. the only thing we have to do, and, like, we'll be fine. And then I, I just had the call, and then it was done. Yeah. <laughs> it was like that five minutes – Probably doubled revenue. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. Just because you had the time to actually zoom out, look at it. Yeah. While he's still down in the weeds yep. doing the reason he's there in the first place. Yeah. And that's why the partnership there works. Like, we have proper expectations of like, hey, I'm going, wh- I'm not going to work the same amount of hours as you, but the hours I do work are going to make a drastic difference for the company. And I think the same thing will be said for, any business anyone here builds like you'll probably never be fully out of any business in your life. Like unless you just sell and you go, you know, you go public and you you bounce, but, (laughs) um, you know, you're still always doing something at least monitoring it. That that's what I do a lot now. I'm like, all right, show me the stats. Like, let me see what's going on. Okay. All right. Things are going as, as planned. Great. All right. Not let's keep it going. And then the minute things slip. All right. What are we changing? Because that's business. It's right. a constant game of adjustments, just like baseball. Right. And, and, you know, I think it's important that you also work in the business as well at, at a certain point because when you are overseeing everything and you see there's an issue, you can probably diagnose it pretty quickly because you know where to look. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's another thing. You've seen me tell this to everyone in the coaching. They're like, when should I hire my first cold caller? It's a very common question. I'm like, and once you've cold called like a lot yep. and practiced it and understood what these, these cold callers are going to go through, 
And that way you can teach them and train them. Because if you've never experienced it and you can't teach them and train them properly, it's going to be very difficult for them to succeed. Right. And I, I, I'm guilty of that to a degree. I mean, there are things I've really never done, like actually fix the house up myself. And I know a lot of flippers who have. And, I, and I'm actually kind of envious of them because they do have that understanding of like, what it is half the time I'm, I look at things and I'm like, it doesn't look right. And then they're like, well, this is why X, Y, Z. But had I had that experience, I would have known that, Right. you know, I'm like, Oh, okay. I guess I'm an idiot, <laughs> 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 but yeah, it's, it's fun, man. I, I enjoy the game of business. I think the more I learn about it, just from running it. Once again, right? I'm running businesses. The more I learn to manage a lot of businesses and a lot of different things, it's it, it becomes more fun because it becomes this challenge of like, all right, I got a limited number of hours per day. How do I really maximize them to the fullest? Like right. it's fun. Yeah. And I mean, do you do you find yourself almost applying like your the principles from training and stuff from baseball? To all your businesses? Yeah, so one of our core values out there, you've seen it, is train daily. And the reason for that is like, you and I both know in baseball, you better be trying to get better every day or you're getting passed up. Exactly. And, you know, even when, you, when you're on your way to the big leagues, you know, I have to get better. I'm not there. And then even when you get to the big leagues, you know, I have to get better because this guy's also trying to get better than me and take my spot. Or you're, you know, trying to get better so you can get that big free agent payday. You right. know, everybody's working for that one big payday. Right. Um, and so I, I think about it the same way with business. That was probably the biggest thing I took from baseball is like, hey, how do we get better every day? Not how do we work harder. You know? Everyone's working hard. Yeah. <laughs> one of my core, there's no core value out there that says work hard. Right. That's <laughs> uh, a given. Yeah. I don't need to tell you that on the, like, work hard, guys. Right. <laughs> But what I do want to tell you is, in addition to working hard, you should be training daily, getting better. And whether that's on your own time, whether that's in the office, like if you see our office, we have trainings all the time for our sales guys. You know, I'm constantly meeting with my top guys, trying to train them on being better managers. And I mean, what do I do in the coaching program? I'm literally just training everyone in there to become a better investor, a more well-rounded investor. And I think that's like the biggest thing that I took away from baseball. Yeah, I was just in an event a couple of days ago and there were some really good speakers there. And uh, one of the speakers is an author that um, wrote, a, it was centered around basketball mostly, but I mean, it's, it's sports in general and business. These, these principles still apply, and one of them was um, next play. And so, I, you know, I'm in a room with a bunch of business owners that, that have had successful businesses, and it's whenever I'm in a situation like that, it's always really interesting to me because, you know, I was um, successful at baseball. So, you know, you could kind of say I built my career up to the point where I was in the, in the major leagues. Uh, but again, like I had to be really good at those kind of, um, uh, what's the word, um, you know, not external, but those X factors, yeah, uh, the mental side. And I always think it's interesting in a room like that where you have people who are really successful and they hear something as simple, which to me, it's, it's not simple and it's not easy. They've just never heard it before. To me, it was automatic. Like as a pitcher... And as a hitter, if you're thinking about your last at bat, how do you think your next at bat's going to go? <laughs> Not good. Not good. Yeah. Unless you hit a homer and you're like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then you're kind of feeling yourself. <laughs> but even then, the, even then, it, it can actually work against you because maybe you hit a homer last time. This next at bat, you try and get real big. Yeah, and you're you pop juiced out. up. Yeah. And, yep. Yeah. So it, you it don't can, do what got you there. Right. Exactly. Um, so again, to to me, it like next pitch, next play is automatic, and it's it's weird sitting where I am now because now I'm looking for the next thing to apply it to. I need to go build the thing, the the vehicle, the the business. And that's the hard part because I've never done that before. But I guess in a way I have. But I'm looking for the thing to apply those principles to, whereas someone on the other end is like, oh, next play, you know, 
so, uh, countless things that you don't expect happen in business. And just the concept of, okay, it's done. What do we do next is, is a lot of times the thing that takes them to the next level. I, I just think that's interesting. Yeah. And honestly, I've never heard anyone really say that, but it's literally what I do. So I have on my Apple, my reminders tab. And if you look, it's like, it says 8,000 tasks completed. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just how I, you know, keep it so that that next thing I need to do. And it's not any type of like huge vision, right? I have, it, you know, I've created this thing called the Raise Planner. And that's where we put our very big goals and those things. And I look at those every day. But on the day-to-day -day basis, I use the, the reminders thing on Apple. And so whenever there's any type of task, it goes on there and it annoys the heck out of me until I complete it. And so for today, like I'm just looking at it right now, I need to buy a bookshelf. We just talked about that. Yeah. I need to buy the bookshelf right there. I put it yeah. right there. It just happened. Um, we're starting a nonprofit. I have to talk with Mindy about our vision for it. We got to come up with a mission statement. So we're going to dinner tonight. We're going to come up with a mission statement. That's how you make the dinner a write-off, guys. Um, you talk about, you know, well, nonprofits. Well, you know, nonprofit has expenses. This is like one of those. Well, just kidding. It's not <laughs> going to be for the nonprofit. But we're going to talk about other things that I'll expense to one of my other businesses. Because um, the nonprofit doesn't even exist today. But um, we're trying to just figure out the vision for the nonprofit. And, uh, you know, I, I, I want to narrow it down so we can get this thing going. Because the longer I procrastinate figuring out the vision, it just doesn't happen. Right. And this other one is making a TikTok about something. So <laughs> 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 it just shows the wide range of, like, what a task can be. Right. Something all the way from buying a bookshelf that takes five seconds to making a TikTok that's going to require some effort and thinking to requiring a mission statement that's really big, right? you know? And like, though I'm just the type of guy who gets annoyed having them on there because I look at it every day. It's all I do. It's like, I accomplish one task. What's the next task? All right. All right. I'm just on to that one. And anytime I, I have free time, I'm literally spending it to get those tasks done before I move on to something else. Yeah, and that's, <laughs> that's interesting because earlier you said that we were very opposite. And while I do, and I use your planner, by the way, and I love it, and it's, <laughs> it gets me more task-oriented. Yeah. But naturally, I'm very big picture. Yeah. The, I, I get kind of uh, almost, um, I don't know, bored with the, with the tasks. Yeah. You know? um, so it's, but definitely your, your planner has really helped me, like, at least for the, sometimes I literally have to do it for the whole week. Yeah. And do it that way because almost the daily, I don't, I don't know why. Yeah. It's just, I don't know. Everyone's <laughs> it's just, got, yeah, everyone's it's personal got to me, yeah. but, um, but yeah, the, the planner really is helpful in it. I love how it, like you go from a five-year vision to a one year because I'm really good at, <laughs> at that part. <laughs> yeah. The five years. Great. <laughs> I'm, I'm even good at like the, the quarterly stuff, which is great. And it's, you know, I never really thought of it in that way, but it really gave like measurable, Mm -hmm. uh, KPIs, key performance in indicators, right? Yep, yeah, <laughs> key performance uh, indicators. Uh, things for me to track to make sure I'm doing those things so I don't get too lost in the big picture stuff and do nothing. Yeah, you know, <laughs> 100%. And, and by the way, guys, if you're like, dude, I want this planner, where's it at? If you just go to ryanpineda.com, you can download it completely for free. I've made it for free for everyone. It's uh, something I worked really hard on because it was a planner that didn't exist. It's just something that... I personally have been doing. I was like, man, I need to just give this to everybody. And also too, I don't like doing this uh, manually, <laughs> uh, writing it in my journal every day. So I made it, you know, digitally. So it's super cool that way. Um, but I think as it relates to task and big vision and balancing it, you're right. There are people I see all the time who are both ways. There's one guy who can't think big at all because their mind, like, they just can't see it. They're like, man, there's no way I could ever do that. And then there are the guys who, I guess I would call them just more delusional than anything. <laughs> They're like, yeah, I'm going to be a billionaire. Yeah. Like, how are you going to get, like, what's and the a, plan? Yeah, and a degree of delusion is necessary. Yeah. But you can't be so far over into delusional. <laughs> yeah, you have to, like, have a legit 
yeah, this is how it's going to look, how I'd get there, right? You got to understand at least some like basic level steps. But then it becomes, okay, if I have this huge big vision, which I personally have big visions, okay? And then you saw me, my day-to-day task. How do you bridge the gap in between? Well, I think it comes down to what the planner is doing. Like, hey, what is my one-year goal? What are these targets? Okay, great. How do I break these one-year targets to quarterly targets? Okay, so I'm making sure I'm staying on track. Okay, then monthly targets. What is the things I, or like, what are the top five most important things this month I need to do that'll push me towards my quarterly goal, which in turn pushes me towards my yearly goal, which in turn pushes me towards that huge five-year goal. Right. And so it kind of is working backwards. And so that's why I say when, you know, you get a, somebody who tells me they want to be a billionaire, I'm like, all right, like you better have some legit steps backwards. How are you doing it? Oh, well, you know, I'm going to flip a a million houses a year. How many have you flipped today? Oh, you haven't done a deal yet. I don't, I don't think you're going to be a billionaire in five years. Start with 10. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Like let's. Come on, let's get something we could actually, you know, really realistically figure out. Well, let's here. start with one, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that that's what the planner's really good for. Um, it, it's funny because you you have the opposite end of the spectrum with Grant Cardone, who's like ten x everything, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, you know, I I actually had one of my five year goals is to be worth a hundred million. I I do believe it's very attainable, and if I was listening to Grant Cardone, it would be, hey, you need to be a billionaire right. in five years. And in my mind, do I believe I can do that? I think there's a slight chance. I don't know. But it's not like I'm striving for it. Right. You know? But Again, because you're, you're, more, you're more step-oriented, task-oriented, which, is, yeah. which will allow you to get there yeah. eventually I, I if guess, you want. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, true. <laughs> Dude, to be a billionaire yeah. is not like – an easy endeavor, even if you have the capability to do it. It's still a decision. Um, But, yeah, I think you have to have that big vision, and then you also have to have the discipline to just take the steps day by day and just knock out the task that really will help you get there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, cool, dude. That was a a deep talk, man. I enjoy enjoy talking about baseball because nobody else – gets it <laughs> every time I talk about it I'm like oh boy here we go again yeah. <laughs> like look this guy agrees with me no no it's <laughs> it's definitely true and all the all the stuff you talk about and just one other thing popped in my head uh you, you mentioned your sales pitch to me you didn't have to pitch a whole lot because I think all you said was you know it's something like it's like you know did you have a pitching coach well yeah okay so you need a coach for this Oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> that was I, I pretty remember much that. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like we have coaches. That would you hire? You know this but guy. It's it's, <laughs> it's completely true because, yeah. especially something that you may not have done before. What do you think is the best way to do it? Sure, you can bumble your way through and hack your way through and yeah, figure it out. Why not speed it up? Yeah, you know? <laughs> just get the guy who already did it. You know. Yeah. So, no, I totally agree. I I take that principle in everything I do in life now. I, I don't even know freaking 1% of the stuff that's going on. Like, I am just trying to accelerate everything. Because, like you said earlier on, time is the only limited resource we have. I can right. make my money back. Right. Whatever I pay this guy, it'll as long as I truly believe in what he's going to teach and also that I'm going to be able to do this, it's going to be worth it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I believe that so much that I, you know, shortly after doing the, the house flip, I went and did it again with multifamily. Yeah. You know, found someone who was exactly where I wanted to be. Yep. And said, show me how to do it. Yeah. And that's how much I believe it. Even though, like, you could even construe the other experience as a bad one, I don't at all. Yeah. It was completely necessary and part of the evolution, the, process. the development. Yeah. For sure. Well, cool, dude. We'll have to get you back on again, man. Um, super proud to see, you know, how far you've come um, in a short amount of time since you've retired. And, um, Looking forward to partnering on some deals together and, yeah. you know, we'll film some content at them. Absolutely. I love it. Sounds good. Thanks cool, for man. having me on. This was a lot of fun. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. Peace. Thanks for watching the Ryan Pineda Show. If you want to work with me, head over to ryanpineda.com. You can find my courses, coaching programs, and upcoming events. We also have free resources you can download, so head over to ryanpineda.com.